let's start by talking about concepts and um, conceptualization. So a concept is a sort of very broad term, and it's basically any mental image that um, is summarizing any kind of set of observations or feelings or ideas, but it's this like very, very fuzzy concept. Um, and so it's abstract. It's like when you have an idea about, I wonder if there, you know, is some impact of something, or it's like when you first are forming your ideas for research, you're forming these concepts. So they're these very fuzzy, abstract kind of ideas. And then conceptualization then is that the process of your, you're specifying a little bit more by what you mean by this abstract term. Um, and particularly from a deductive research standpoint, you're taking portions of theory and translating them into some specific ideas to then create your very even more specific hypothesis, which is then a testable statement. So you start with this like fuzzy idea, like, I think, you know, anger might be related to crime. And so then conceptualization is like, well, what do you mean by anger? And, you know, what type of anger are you talking about? And, um, and so from a deductive standpoint, then it would be like, well, if we think, you know, it has some kind of to do with the relationship between emotions and crime that there is some kind of existing theory about, um, well, then we're going to sort of translate that into specifically what we're doing. Whereas from an inductive approach, it would be, um, again, going that opposite way. So it'd be making sense of those patterns and relationships um, that, uh, and sort of that those, any kind of patterns that you find from your initial data set. So you come up with those um, empirical generalizations and then um, inductively you would then come up with your concepts, your conceptualization uh, and your conceptualization stage to make patterns, to make or sorry, to make sense of those patterns. So conceptualization then is basically narrowing down and specifying more what you mean by some fuzzy abstract kind of term. And then here's where we get sort of more into the specifics of what we really need when we're talking about research, because then you take that conceptualization. So you've now conceptualized and really come up with what it is that you're doing. And then the operation then is how you're measuring those concepts. And so you're identifying the value of a variable. So for example, for subject number one, you know, this is the value on variable X. So if the variable is gender, then subject one has a value of one, which means that they're female, let's say. So the operation then is the actual measure. So um, the operationalization then is measuring is sort of how you come up with the operation, essentially. So the operationalization process is probably the most important when we're sort of forming research and wanting to conduct research because the operationalization process is where you actually come up with what are your variables. Um, so it's essentially creating the operations. So this is where you figure out how, so you start with that fuzzy term, um, so let's go with anger again as that example. So that's the concept we want to measure is anger, but then how do we conceptualize that? Do we mean how people self-report feeling anger? Do we mean um, how they behave with their peers? Do we mean how they react to bad news? Those are all different ways to conceptualize that fuzzy concept of anger. And then operationalizing that can be difficult, but once we figure out what specific aspect of anger we're interested in, say how people behave when they're with their peers, then we can specify the specific operations through the operationalization process. So things like um, maybe we're going to covertly observe a workplace setting and measure specific behaviors like rude remarks or negative facial expressions. Um, and so that's going to be our specific operation, our specific variable. And um, it it, we sort of come from that larger sort of very fuzzy concept of anger to something really specific that we can now measure. And that's kind of how that whole process works. Here's another example, a very fuzzy concept that we often want to know more about is violence. So within criminal justice research or criminological research, you want to know, we, we often want to know about violence. Violence is a very fuzzy term. So maybe we conceptualize that our conceptualization is uh, well, we want to look at the level of violence within a specific crime. So maybe we want to look at um, the level of violence within um, a sexual assault. Then 
the operationalization of that conceptualization would be, well, let's look at a specific crime outcome, like whether the victim was hospitalized for injuries as a result of the crime. Uh, so then we have, again, we've taken that fuzzy concept of violence, conceptualized it into, well, specifically, we want to see how much violence is within um, a sexual assault context. And then we're going to operationalize that by saying, well, was the victim hospitalized for their um, for the injuries sustained during the crime? So that operationalization process, which then that is our, our variable or our operation. Um, and that is that that is a very important process to go through to be able to figure out um, how exactly we're going to measure things. And then um, and and so once you have once you've done your op, once you've operationalized your variables, then you're ready to start data collection. Assuming you've done everything ethically and um, come up with good hypotheses and all that good stuff, too. But once you have your variables ready, once they're operationalized, that means they are ready to go. So. One way um, that we can gather information and sort of one, um, one type of operation we can have uh, is through constructing questions within um, either a survey, um, which is the most typical, but it could also be within an interview um, so if it's a structured interview that has questions that you're following. But anytime you're constructing questions, um, you can have closed-ended uh, or open-ended questions. So closed-ended questions are fixed choice questions. These would be, um, you have responses to choose from. So if you, it's the same idea if you take um, you know, an exam and you have multiple choice or true false questions, those are closed-ended, fixed choice questions. And so it's the same thing if you're doing a survey and, con and collecting data that way. It would be you have you know, these specific options to choose from. So it could be something like, how are you feeling today? And your options are either happy, neutral, or sad, let's say, or positive, neutral, or negative, or something. Um, Likert scales are another very good example of closed-ended questions, which are the ones where you have, um, you know, rate your level of agreement with a particular statement. And then you go from like, strongly disagree, disagree, neither agree nor disagree, agree or strongly agree, and you go and then you choose. That's a closed-ended question, a very common type of closed-ended questions within um, social science research. There are then, of course, there are also open-ended questions where um, you're asked questions where there are no specific response choices and you're basically allowed to say and respond however um, you feel best is going to answer the question for you. Um, so these are typically either written answers, so like and again, going back to the exam example, this would be like an essay question or a, or a short answer question where you can write whatever you want. There's just a certain amount of space. Um, so that could be in a survey. It could just be you know, where you have a, a box. You know, if it's an online survey, you have a box, you know, type in um, adding any additional information or whatever. Or it could be within a, an, a structured interview, it might just be a, a question that says, well, you know, what do you feel about this? Or what's your experience with this? Or uh, how, um, <clears throat> you know, how would this situation, how would you, what would you do in this situation? And so it's very open-ended. It's not a closed-ended question like, uh, what is your gender out of these options? Or what is, what age group would you put yourself in out of these options? Or something like that. And then another way that we can um, sort of operationalize our variables is through making observations. And so we can, uh, anytime we're making observations, we're measuring characteristics of something based on some way that we are observing those things. So we can measure characteristics about specific individuals. We can measure characteristics about events or places, but it's anything that we can observe either with our eyes or really any sense if we want to observe sound you can do that too or smells or whatever but the most common is just you observe you watch to see what happens and you take note of whatever's happening and systematic observation is kind of a a specific way to observe something but to do it in a really reliable way and so there are really explicit rules that you follow when you're using systematic observation. And so you, you, know, you might have boxes to check while you're, say, observing police interactions. And so you're going to check boxes if officers use certain words or gestures or the type of physical contact was made, that was made or something like that. You have really explicit, you know, I'm going to check this when this specific thing happens. And you come up with all these ahead of time so that it standardizes what you look for and sort of how you would, you know, so for the police example, whether it's a, um, a 
becomes a violent encounter or not, you're going to have very specific ways of determining whether you're going to call it a violent encounter or not. <clears throat> so what it does is it really standardizes coding practices, not only so that within the same person looking over different situations, they're going to measure things the same way, but also you could have different people measuring different things maybe that are happening at the same time or just to gather more data more easily, having more people do that, then you can, if you have standard rules to follow, then anybody observing the same thing should basically get the same thing if they're following some kind of explicit rules set out within a systematic observation kind of situation. So it makes it so that you have multiple people observing and you're going to get usable results across different um, people who are collecting data. <clears throat> and then you can also collect unobtrusive measures. And so this is where you collect data about people where they don't directly know uh, or they're not directly participating. And this doesn't mean we're doing anything unethical. It's just ways of collecting information about people without directly interacting with them um, or observing them. And of course, people can mean individuals or groups. And this does overlap with observations in the sense that these are unobtrusive observations, but there's a type of observation in which the subjects have consented to being observed, and this is a type where there, no consent is necessary. Um, so the first, there are four types. The first is physical trace evidence. And so this is where you are basically looking to see um, any leftover evidence that people have done something or been somewhere or what they have uh, their behavior in certain areas. So this can be either through erosion or accretion. And so erosion would be things like some of the most common are like the wearing away or removal of products or materials because of um, physical presence or activity of people. So things like footpaths, um, things like elements that are missing from a crime scene might be something. <clears throat> But anything where something is worn away or taken away because of physical presence of people. Whereas accretion is the opposite. It's the, it's the addition or the building up of, of some kind of product or material because of, again, physical presence or, or activity by people. So that could be um, things like fingerprints or blood spatter at a crime scene, but it could also be um, like garbage in certain areas or things like that. Anything that would show um, people's presence and something that you can measure. Then another type of unobtrusive measures is archives. And this is data that's available in some kind of like hard copy format. So things like library records, sentencing reports, judge decisions or trial transcripts. And basically you're inspecting some kind of historical evidence. And historical just means it has happened in the past. It could be recent past or it could be really far in the past. But you're inspecting some kind of historical evidence to make sense of some kind of social process that's responsible for any kind of changes or um, whatever you find in the historical records. And so this can also allow for a longitudinal analysis because you can look at changes over time. So we could look at things like um, how newspaper headlines have changed you know, when reporting something like homicide. And you know, what does it look like 100 years ago? What does it look like 50 years ago? And, and sort of decade by decade, what are the changes? That would be an archival, unobtrusive observation. Then there's also simple observation. So this could be just is like watching people, but there's no, they don't know they're being watched. The only time you can ethically do this would be like in public places or where there's no expectation of privacy. So something like watching how children interact on a playground um, would be a simple observation. But then there's also a contrived observation <clears throat> where you're using some kind of like hidden recording devices or you're manipulating something to create a response. So if you record a dark alley at night to see what crime is happening in this alley, that would be a contrived observation because you're not there. So you don't have an sort of an effect of your presence, even however minute. Um, but also it would be if you like make a crime happen and see what people remember or see what people do in response to that, then that would be you're making something happen and then observing how people respond. And so that would be a contrived observation. <clears throat> 